What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Monday, February 12th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Biden plans will earmark millions of acres for public land for solar development. Next up, India and Russia in talks over long term oil deals. Then next up, how the Rockefellers and billionaire donors pressured Biden on LNG exports fly across the pond to Venezuela as they deploy military to the border of Guyana, a.k.a. the Guyana oil fields. Absolutely crazy story there. And then finally, if we couldn't get stupider in the greatest state in the world, Colorado legislators push bill to end oil well drilling by 2030. I am not making this up. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets um, Thursday um, and Friday. We did see rig counts come out. Absolutely hilarious considering where Henry uh, gas prices are right now. We saw some very interesting moves in rig counts, so I will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. But as always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by the executive producer of the show, the purveyor of the show, Stuart Turley. Go ahead and kick us off. Hey, let's start with our buddy over there, Biden. Biden will earmark millions of acres of public land for solar development. You know, where, Michael, where did the ESG, where did the environment, social, and governance disappear to? Because now it's okay to wipe out millions Mm -hmm. of acres for this. Under the new guidance, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, not the other BLM, will earmark broad pockets of land across the West for potential solar development. Uh, 22 million acres is accepting bulk comments. I got one bulk comment from the farmers in a truck and dropping it on their bulk comment section. This is despicable. Yeah, I think if you if 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 Miss Producer can come up and throw this picture up, it's it's a, a screenshot of the western half of the United States. You can see everywhere highlighted in green is the is is part of that 22 million acres that we're talking about. You see some of the other color. I mean, you, you're basically talking about all of Nevada between what the red and and green is you're basically right. talking about the entire western half of Arizona lots of New Mexico there's even some in Colorado which we'll get to in a bit Wyoming's going to have a lot i mean basically you're t- you're you're taking off huge swaths of all of these different states and for how much power generation you're not going to be able to power even the entire west coast with and, that and it's the grid takeaway michael it's mm-hmm. storage we're talking a balloon doggle. I mean, this is like a horrific mess that is not properly even thought and, out. And, and what I want to know is, and, and this article doesn't do a good job of saying this, how did they come to the determination where they're going to put this? My hope is they're starting with places where nobody lives anyway. Because the worst part is if you're now if all of a sudden you're going to start having to do eminent domain and things of that sort to take away people's land to do this, it's going to get absolutely crazy out there. So I'm hopeful that they're at least going to and this 22 million acres is hopefully either already federally owned or they're not coming in and like wiping out people's okay. you know land, but they will. It doesn't matter if it's federally owned or not. Here's the thing. I have repelled into the Grand Canyon. I've hiked 30 miles down. I've hung off of these things. I'm a big outdoor fan. I want to be out there. You throw in what we did to West Texas with those $3.5 billion worth of uh, damage coming across to the plains. You start putting that in the beautiful mountains out there or the beautiful desert, you're going to kill animals and wildlife, and you're going to even do even more. Where's the Sahara Club? Where is Greenpeace? Where are all these ecological folks that are supposed to be upset about uh, taking care of Mother Earth? Where are they? This is despicable. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be extremely interesting. And I mean, I think this last part is hilarious. So they've identified 22 million acres. But then what they're claiming, the BLM, in partnership with NREL, which is a, 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 a another Colorado-based energy laboratory. I've, I've, I've done some good work. They, they do good work, but th- this stat absolutely blows my mind. 
They're claiming that only 700,000 acres of that 8 to 55 million guidance, where that 22 million is the center of acres, is available for solar products will need to be developed to hit the Biden targets administration of meeting reaching 100% carbon-free energy sector by 2030. That, why would you earmark 50? So then what do they do? Why do you need 55 million then? If you only need 700,000 acres for the development of 100% clean electric grid by 2030, why are you earmarking 22 million? So that tells me one of two things. They just want the land. It's a massive land grab and a takeover. Or they're just lying about this study. One of the two has to be right. Both. It's probably, of course. Yeah. Of, it's but a remember, land that's grid. only they're enough to, to power. If you read the next sentence, it's only enough to power 515,000 homes. Oh, sweet. So not even everybody in Dallas. No. Uh, this is a land grab is what it is. You identified it correctly. Sometimes a blind mice finds cheese once in a while. What's next? Okay. India and Russia in talks over long-term oil deals from Bloomberg. Um, Miss Producer, if you would fly in the picture of the Russian uh, standing in there, I guarantee you, if this was a movie... Michael, this looks like Bill Murray. <laughs> I do not know how we found Bill Murray as a 90-year-old Russian, but we found him. <laughs> it's funny. So when we sit back and take a look, Indian Oil has a contract with Rosenfit from 2020. Uh, was to import 20 million tons of Euro-grade crude but it is now extended through 2023 and they're going to increase it even more. Um, Russia export an average of 1.75 million barrels of crude to India per day. That's nuts. Isn't that great for them? I mean, it, it's a clear sign from the Modi administration out there in, in India that they are going to uh, they're they're going to get the cheapest energy possible. You know, climate be damned, I guess, you know, but from 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 I think from from their perspective, why would exactly why would they not? You know, considering the 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 spread between what Russian crude is trading at versus what um the, the open market is. I mean, we saw oil prices jump about four or five percent this week, while Russian crude is still benchmarked somewhere in that sixty dollar range. Um, you know, you know, we know right now that it's only uh, that that they're only importing or their total imports from Russia account for about thirty to thirty four percent. But it's that's really what's crazy is they point out that that's only up 0.2 percentage points before the start of the Ukraine conflict. So what they're saying is they're just they, they, there's no change in policy, which I think is an interesting point. Oh, I'll tell you, the other uh, funny thing is, uh, if you look at uh, uh, oil minister Hardeep Singh Puri said that Russia uh, currently accounts for 30 to 34 percent of India's oil imports. That is a big trading partner now, yeah. I, and they're trading in ruples away from the U.S. petrodollar. That's uh, a good. That's also a very good point. Is all of this is happening not on the petrodollar? And uh, I want to know, and I don't know if there's any way to really find this, but you're going to find out how much of this is going against the OPEC uh, plus uh, quota by if you found out which tankers uh, this was coming in on. If it was Dark Fleet, it's not being reported to the OPEC Plus production numbers for mm -hmm. pricing. So this is all being, in my estimation, or my ballpark uh, crayon uh, on a big, your big chief tablet, uh, was saying this is outside of OPEC Plus pricing. All right, what's next? Let's go to how the Rockefellers... I'm not a Rockefeller fan. Uh, how the Rockefellers and billionaire donated don donors pressured Biden on LNG exports. This is really despicable. Um, let me read you just a couple things in here. Uh, Biden last month uh, effectively froze the approval process for new LNG terminals while his administration takes stock of the country's newfound status as the world's largest LNG exporter. Here's a quote. They got our attention, a senior Biden administration official said about the activist efforts describing their campaign as intense. They got their attention. Yeah, they wrote another damn check. 
would we get lobbyists out of our political stuff? This is absolutely despicable. Yeah. Um, the Exxon Mobil, a successor to Standard Oil, the fossil fuel monopoly founded by the Rockefellers. Ah, oh, there's a little bit of a tie in there. Hmm. A anyway. I mean, so this it, article it, goes into D. It's from the Wall Street Journal, and it goes into uh, a lot more about Bezos. It goes into a lot more about who was actually yanking on uh, the Biden administration. We know it's not Biden that they're yanking. Well, I mean, it, it, this just I mean, every everything in the United States comes down to lobbying. Who's got the money? Who's funneling it where? I mean, for years, we've known that Greenpeace was funded by Russian oil. Why? Because they want to shut down U.S. oil and gas to raise the price of their oil. I mean, it's it's not hard to find this out. Now, why some of this, you know, why does someone like Michael Bloomberg and Bill Gates and the Rockefellers, which is interesting, as you pointed out, their legacy being considering they started oil and gas in the United States, but come now and 100 years later, who are they all in bed with? They all have investments in green energy. They all have investments in different climates. Michael Bloomberg doesn't care one way or the other how his electricity is getting generated. He doesn't even know. But what he's into is he's into green energy. He's got investments in green. I'm sure he does. And I'm just so why are they in on that? Well, because it's going to make them more money in the long run. I disagree. I think if you looked at under his uh uh investments i think you'd also see just like warren buffett they're investing heavily into oil and gas uh black rock is now investing into oil and gas so they're I think probably in everything it, but they also exactly. but they but remember oil and gas isn't accountable to them they want they want the new energy regime to be accountable to them so if it becomes clean energy guess who they're accountable to not the old the new cool what's next Yep, let's head over to the next one. Venezuela. Uh, this one is really uh, concerning. Uh, Venezuela deploys military to oil-rich Guiana border. This one is not being talked about. Miss Producer, if you could uh, bring up the map. If you take a look at uh, Venezuela and little tiny Guyana is right parked right on next to it, and then you have the state of Brook block right outside of that with Exxon and Chevron uh, are out in there. Michael, this is really disheartening that the why would a dictator want to roll over and start a war? Oh, because he can. Well, because well, there's I, newfound oil, oh, because course. his oil fields are so uh, out of shape that he's now going to step in and go, hey, these are some beautiful new rigs. Those are mine. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, to, to give a quick history lesson, these the, the reason why these um, the military from Venezuela has parked itself basically on the border of Guyana is mainly because these are theoretically territorial waters that have long been claimed by Venezuela, but they haven't cared enough about until oil was found to go get. So that's sort of the, the tug and the pull, obviously, you know, obviously it's a complete, a complete ruse. What Stu said is exactly correct. The reason why what's going on here is they want access to the revenues. They're going to yeah. come out of all of this drilling because their uh, oil facilities are extremely deteriorated and it would take Huge amounts of capital investment, which the communist regime doesn't have because they're yeah. they're too busy starving their own people exactly. um, to Let actually put this on. Here. Chevron and China's uh, CNOOC off the coast of Guyana, where production has soared 645,000 barrels of crude a day, is not far from what Venezuela produces. So, ah, there's the numbers. Mm. Here, Exxon also says, quote unquote, we're not going anywhere. Our focus remains on developing the resources efficiently and responsibly per our agreement with the Guyanese uh, government, spokeswoman Michelle Gray said in a statement. Now, what does she mean we're not going anywhere? Do they think that, you know, if you're Venezuelan, you take over uh, Guyana, are you going to throw Exxon or Chevron who's operating it out? No. Is Exxon or Chevron still going to be running it? Yes. Who's the victim? I mean, who's going to get mauled and thrown over with the bathwater? It's going to be the poor Guyana, Guyanese yeah. as they get taken over. 
and 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 you wonder and and I mean clearly whoever's providing the insurance for this project it, it is clearly has got to be charged more. I, I read somewhere that insurance rates to get equipment out to Guyana have skyrocketed recently. Oh. So yeah. you have to remember there's that whole you know if they can't keep, if they can't have an active insurance policy you're going to have a hard time finding vendors. I mean that's really where you know if if we want to look under the hood here, you know, we, we we could talk about how the insurance industry is is on the is on the precipice of understanding trends because it's literally their job to insure businesses. So if you want to look right. at what businesses are working and what businesses aren't, go look at the businesses that insure them. And so it's going to be super interesting to see how this all plays out because sure, Exxon may be able to continue producing, but if there's right. escalating tensions, how expensive is it going to be? Oh, I'll tell you, uh, it, Michael, outstanding point. And it's just like why EVs may fail. Yep. It's not because of the amount of money that's being thrown at the EVs. It's the insurance. It's mm -hmm. the insurance that is now coming up and killing the EVs. Um, it's not going to be the politician saying we're going to go that way. It's going to be the insurance companies. It's going to be the tankers. The you know, How yep. did they enforce uh, sanctions? They they sanctioned the insurance companies is how they got to those tankers. Uh, yeah, I mean, how expensive is it going to be to continue to get crude out of Guyana, considering that you have to find an insurance policy to cover the tanker to come pick it up? And if you've got three thousand, uh, you, know, you know, guards at the border ready to shoot, who knows? Now, I think in reality this is a bluff. But what is nervous is what does the United States decide to do? You, you want my honest opinion? Unfortunately, I do, but I also think it's going to scare us. But yes, I want to hear it. I can become somebody to the hell. Great, you don't know. <laughs> no, what I'm saying, I was my uh, President Biden in imitation. Mm. Got it, got it. What's next? <laughs> Let's go to Colorado <laughs> before I lose my mind. Oh, that's been done before. Okay, um, let's go here. It's going to Colorado. Colorado legislators push bill to end oil well drilling by 2030. The industry is preparing for its biggest political fight yet in the state. Michael, I don't know how to even start with this one. I love Colorado. Both my kids were born there. Absolutely love the state. Everybody fleeing from Colorado, uh, from California, have destroyed the sanity yep. in that state. Let's go through some of this. You and I uh, were able to help PDC really uh, get their first uh, wells drilled with uh, some of your outstanding permits work. post SB one eighty one. Not yes. drilling. We were we of being continuing to become more frosty to oil and gas. I mean, and basically what they've done now is they've gone ahead and they've, you know, submitted articles to 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 be put on the ballot to stop oil and gas drilling by 2030. Basically, they're going to be revoking the and they're going to do this by revoking the ability to permit new wells. This draft language um according to Denver Business Journal has been discussed with both leaders on the environmental side and um, within the state legislator, and we expect to see a bill submitted within the next month. So according to the draft of the bill that was seen by the Denver Business Journal, it would basically tell the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Co Commission, that state agency that regulates oil and, um, um, and well production. It used to be the COGCC. They've now shifted it up a little bit because they got to throw in carbon management. Absolutely crazy. They're basically going to tell them to stop issuing new permits um, for wells by January 1st, 2030. That basically, so it, it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game. Um you would still be able to permit wells in that six year time frame, but you would have to drill them by 2033 or risk that permit expiring. So are they shutting it down completely? No. So what this really is, is absolutely is just a, uh, a it's carrot stick for for all of the environmentalists out there that are that are again giving them money you look at where the money's coming from what's as, as Stu said everybody from california has come in and just ruined what used to be the greatest state in america in my opinion i'm i so uh i agree you know yeah absolutely uh, 
Uh, now, here's the thing. Uh, there's 48,000 active wells and 57, uh, 50,000 inactive plugged wells. Uh, the wells are on track to produce 165 million barrels of oil and much larger amounts of natural gas. If the good citizens of Colorado would like to be turned into New York or California, vote for this. If you want your kilowatt per hour to go to two or three times, if you want to pay $4,000 a month for your electric bill, knock yourself out. When you move to Texas, leave your voting there in Colorado, like the uh, locust destroying fields and then moving on. Yeah. And I mean, Colorado is sneakily the fourth largest crude oil producer in the United States. You wouldn't guess that, really. You know, you've got your Texas, your Oklahomas, your New Mexicos, your blah, blah, blah. They're above Oklahoma. We produce more. It, you know, you talk about it goes Texas, North Dakota, New Mexico, Colorado. Not for long. It could be doing Not a lot more. Not for long, more. but. No, it could be doing a lot more. And the sad part is the oil and gas companies in Colorado are outstanding, yes. eco-friendly folks. They love the mountains just as much as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's about physics and they just don't want to hear it. Yeah. Man, anyway, yeah. this story just makes me sad. I'm going to go curl up in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll jump over to finance, but before we do that, we'll quickly pay the bills here, guys. As always, this news and analysis that you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that that website stays up to speed with everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy business. Um, check us out in the description below. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can hit the description below. See all of the links to the uh, links to the articles, timestamps, so you can jump around, go listen to a segment again and you'll also be able to check out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com which is our data energy news combo get that while you still can that's going to be eventually here behind a subscription wall and you're going to be paying for it so get it free while you still can you can email the show questions at energynewsbeat.com but as we roll in to finance, guys, markets on Friday did, did okay. S&P 500 about half a percentage point. NASDAQ up one point percentage, uh, percentage point. Is mainly we're seeing a lot of tech uh, tech companies release positive earnings, which, you know, for for considering the SaaS recession we've sort of been in for the past two years, um, um, that's really what's keeping the NASDAQ above water here. We did see um, Bitcoin rise above $48,000, currently sitting 48100 and 43 crude oil closes at a uh, um, 76 84 on Friday. That was up point at eight percentage points, mainly off the back of uh, and mainly finishing off what was a, a, a pretty strong week for prices. Um, you know, that's about 6% on a week over week basis. And, and, and mainly the reason for that is begin, you know, we did see on, 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 on late Wednesday, early Thursday morning, uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister in Israel rejected a Hamas ceasefire proposal. And as long as that conflict continues to rage, we're going to start seeing these big swings in gas prices. You know, I like this, this, this quote from Jim Ritterbush. He's the, the president of, over at Ritter Bush and Associates, he says we believe that this is this type of week to week wide price swings will further characterize the crude markets for the rest of the month. Um, of of short of major bullish headlines out of the Mid East could force adjustments in global oil balances. That's a fancy way of saying we're probably going to be bouncing between seventy and eighty dollars outside of um, you know some crazy macro event that that we can't quite think about. You know. From a natural gas side, Stu, we just continued to see gas prices fall. We're sitting at one dollar and eighty six cents, you know, and, and that's mainly just due to the fact that stocks continue to be high. Um, uh, uh, weather, you know, specifically from a forecast, we look to have a kind of a milder winter right now, and so it's just continued to drive gas prices down. And I find it hilarious, though, Stu, because when you look at the rig count that we 
uh, came on Friday. We actually saw from a top line, and let me go ahead and just pull up the top line. I've got the breakdown here, but from a top line, we saw rigs increase by four uh, week over week to 623. But the key is you got to dive into these numbers a little bit, Stu. Okay, so we increased four rigs. And that makes sense. Oil prices are up. You know, we'd expect to maybe see some, some rigs begin to come online. You dive into the big numbers here. Holy smokes, Stu. They break out the what 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 uh what our friends over at Baker Hughes does is they break it out by oil, gas, horizontal, directional, vertical. Because when you release a permit, you have to pick your target. Hey, where are you drilling and, and specifically yep. what you're targeting? The four new rigs that were added, all yep. in gas plays. Absolutely hmm. unbelievable. We're now seeing gas below two dollars, which I hate to break it to everybody. When gas goes below two dollars, there isn't an economical gas well out there to drill. They don't exist. So right. when you're now seeing four rigs out on the gas side, it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> whoever approved those, whoever whoever signed those rig contracts is kicking themselves right now. They better hope they see a bump in prices well, here soon. There might be a little bit of that. I just talked to uh, Andrew Dittmar, who is a uh, very cool cat from Inveris uh, Friday mm -hmm. on a podcast. And he said that Inveris is calling for $4 uh, gas coming up before too long. And I love the folks over there at Inveris. And so, you know, it may be that they have some information on that coming around the corner. Because well, what did he say? What What was his reasoning? I mean, I don't, we don't need to spoil the podcast, but what was his reasoning? Because I vehemently disagree with that. Um, you know, I, I don't remember. I'm exhausted uh, for getting home from the, 32 podcasts. I'll, I'll give you. So we'll be I'll be interested to hear what his thesis is, because in my opinion, we're still we're, we're still we're still trending above the five year the five year uh, five week rolling or five year rolling average for uh, natural gas stocks. We seem to be having a more milder winter. I mean, the macro events specifically on natural gas, especially with this and, and a lot of the reasons why um, we've seen prices fall is this LNG ban. I mean, this is going to keep a lot of natural gas here, which ironically in the short term for us as a as an electrical consumer, it's probably good. That's the funny part about the, 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 the banning the LNG exports. I think it's a horrendous decision. The free market should decide and there's enough LNG in this country to go around. But if we follow through with that, gas will be 55 cents in MCF. Think about it. If you can't oh, move it anywhere, of course we're going to see prices go down. So I'll be interested to hear when Dittmar comes out and talks about why they believe $4 natural gas. Because, yeah, $4 natural gas, you'll be able to make some money, but not at $1.80. There ain't no economic projects at $1.80. No, I just got to give a shout-out to Inveris. Uh, I really enjoy every one of those folks out there. They, they got good people. Absolutely. Well, speaking of tired, Stu, you are exhausted. We're, we're, we're putting the finishing touches on 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 a great week at NAEP. 32 different interviews. It was nuts, dude. And uh, the the staff is just rolling through them as fast mm -hmm. as they can. I got to give a shout out to R.T. Trevino yep. and David Blackman and also Brian Stubbs uh, from uh, Air Compressor Solutions and also... Um, uh, Keith Stelter uh, out there uh, from American Safety. He helped like you would not believe. I love that man. And uh, I get a picture of me and RT holding up the wall and uh, here's Keith hauling all the tables out. <laughs> yeah. No, we really appreciate everybody who came by the booth and helped out. It was, uh, it was, it was a, a big success. It was a big success that yeah, we're going to be rolling through that. We'll be releasing all that content over the next two weeks. Some of them are going to hit the podcast. Um, some of them will be YouTube. We'll, we'll have a mix in here. Um, check it all out. Um, what, what what should people be, 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 be watching for this week, Stu? Well, I just rolled out one uh, this morning, and uh, it was actually pretty cool. Uh, it was a lot of fun with um, – let's take a look here. The ones I just rolled out was, um, let's see here. It was Sean Dunnigan, and uh, he is with Sat uh, State Statelytics. Uh, hey, if you're going to send good swag, uh, I'll even we'll get you on the show. Yeah, man, got to love it. He was one cool cat. He has Duke Energy and BP and all these others. They measure methane uh, gas leaks. And uh, it is a podcast you don't want to miss.
No, absolutely. We love Satellitics. We love everybody who's uh, come on the podcast. We appreciate it, guys. But with that, we're going to go ahead and let you guys get out of here and start your day. It's Monday, guys. Take a deep breath. You probably have a few meetings that you're going to annoy, but you can make you can get yourself through it. It will almostly be Monday here, or Monday will be over, and we will be back with you on Tuesday for Stuart Turley. I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. Thank you.